revised in the 4th century and then revised again in the 12th century. A document that was in Bibliothèque Nationale in Vienna, but lost to it. Destroyed, in fact, because it was too delicate and too fragile for preservation. But fortunately, a museum in Holland saved a copy of it. And that's a copy that you're going to see. You can see that's the bottom end of England near Dover. Dover. And then the British Channel and on the other side Toulouse. Here. And that's a Mediterranean Sea. It's a map which is 18 feet long and only 18 inches wide. It's called a road map, a term that we hear often. Then you continue along this route, along the Mediterranean, and you come to places like Nijmegen, and that is the museum in which I found this map, Nijmegen in Holland. And then you move on to Lyon or Lyon and then beyond to the next part of the map. You pass through Koblenz in Germany, Marseille in the south on the Mediterranean, then Milano, Ventimiglia which is on the border of Italy and France, Strasbourg in Germany, Timgad which is in North Africa, Timgad. In North Africa, continue again. Then we pass through Corsica and, uh, uh, Corsica and Sardinia, the two islands between Italy and Spain. Milano, which you know, Verona, Siena, Regensburg, Salzburg in Austria. And we move on and we continue. Tibes in uh, North Africa, Ravenna in Italy, um, uh, Tarquinia and Cerveteri, two prehistoric sites prior to the Roman Empire. And continue further, Rome itself, there you are, Rome and Ostia Antica, which is the port of Rome, Carthage on the opposite side in North Africa. And then Ostia, Ostia Antica, that was the port of Rome. Then uh, in North Africa, Susa. And then Salona in Italy. And we continue further. Naples, south of Italy, that's the shoe of Italy. And that's Sicily. Then Salona in it, uh, Sicily. Sorrento near Naples. Sobrata, then. Tripoli, where much of the fighting has been going on recently, Skopje, <coughs> and then Leptis Magnus again in uh, Libya, the famous Roman site of Leptis Magnus, Corinth in uh, Greece, where you have on the on the the Peloponnese is this one, and the Corinth Canal is cut through here, and that's Corinth. Then Sofia, Sparta. Sparta is, the, uh, is in the south of the Peloponnese. Then Athens itself, Athens on the mainland. And then you have Salonika and Philippi, parts of <coughs> Turkey. Then Constanza, which is in, uh, in, in Bulgaria. Benghazi, then Syria, then the Nile River. This is the Nile River. Here you go. This Nile River going to the Lake Victoria in Africa. Then Istanbul, that's Istanbul, and then Crete. Then you move further on. You go to Pergamon, then the Nile Delta. This is the Nile Delta here in North Africa. Then Ephesus in Turkey. 
Jerusalem, and then Rhodes, uh, Jerusalem, Jericho, and then Tyre and Sidon in uh, in uh, uh, in Israel, Damascus, then Antioch, Aleppo, Palmyra. That's the furthest point in Syria, and Arabia is that big part of Arabia, and we come almost to the end of it. We have Mesopotamia, this Mesopotamia, and Babylon here, and the Tigris River going up, and we continue, and these are the Alexandrias I referred to in the north here, in Afghanistan. There were a dozen Alexandrias. And the one furthest beyond the Oxus River was called Alexandria the furthest. Then you have the Indus River here, and what do you see here? That's our little island of Sri Lanka, Taprobian. And then the Ganges is on the other side, and China is on the unknown coastline on the east. But see, one end of the map is Taprobian. And at the other end is Doha. It's a very interesting map. I showed this to a foreign minister in Sri Lanka some time ago, and he wanted a copy of it pinned on his wall, and it's there permanently for anyone to see when they come to Sri Lanka. There is hardly any reason to doubt these facts of historical geography when we know that there was consistent interest in the affairs of the island by the numerous reports, documents throughout the ages by officials, travelers, and traders. The 68, 68 or more names assigned to Sri Lanka in historical times are in many ways a clear testimony of the island's importance as a port of I'm sure there are many more. This is how much I have been able to collect, 68. And these are the names. Amaradip and so on, Ceylon, Ceylon, and then you go on to Elinke, and there to Elam, and so on. The names go down, Ujitpa, Ophi, Palesimondu, and so on. And furthermore, Talismundo and so on, continuing, Salika, Serendip, and so on, continuing, all the names and more names. Silan, you can see the, how the formation of the word Silan begins, Singhala, and so on, Simondi, Simondu, and so on, then Sri Lanka, and so on. And continuing further, Taprobain, and continues until you come to Zilan. And I've given the references in terms of dates and the context where I have found these names. The Melinda Panna of the first century AD indicates the lines of communication through the Mana Straits linking China and the Red Sea. And I quote here, just Hoking as a ship owner was become wealthy by constantly living freight in some sea port town. Will be able to traverse the high seas and go to Wanga and Takhola or China or Sovira or Surat or Alexandria or the Coromandel coast or further India any other place where ships do congregate. An Egyptian scholar, Hussein, states that, however, I quote again, however, the communication between the latter two, Aten and the Malabar coast, was never abandoned as it received an impetus by the rise of Ceylon and later on by the development of maritime relations between West and Southeast Asia. First, by way of the Bay of Bengal, and afterwards round the Malay Pen Peninsula, 
which made the ports of South India suitable half-way stations, unquote. And that gives a rough idea of the so-called silk route of the land over across from the capital of China at that time and then continuing through the Hindu Kush, the Khyber Pass, and then to the south of the Caspian Sea, <laughs> south of the Caspian Sea, and then over to the European region where you have the Black Sea there and the Mediterranean there. And then linking up with the Persian Gulf here and then the Red Sea on the other side, but that's the sea route, the sea route. But then crossing over between India and Sri Lanka, but on the Sri Lankan side between Mana Island and mainland Sri Lanka. And I'll tell you why they avoided the southern route later on. So this was the important point of the sea route. This route was used for carrying silks and light material. The heavy goods like ceramics and so on had to take the sea route. <coughs> the Mena Straits. The popularity of the sea route via the Mena Straits in ancient times can be considered in relation to a possible alternate route to the south of the island. While Mena Strait retain the hazards of shallowness, which ultimately forced its abandonment. The southern way was uninviting due to the hidden rocks that lay to the southeast of the island. Thus the alternate route proved to be a dangerous course to be encountered at great risk, and these misadventures are firmly recorded in the many wrecks that are closely guarded under the Antiquities Ordinance as an archaeological reserve of Sri Lanka under the sea. And thanks to Arthur Clarke, who exploited these areas in 1960, and I, as a young man in the Department of Archaeology, coordinated this work of Arthur Clarke and people like um, the, the man who was a deep sea driver in the Elgian, Throckmorton, a man called Throckmorton. They discovered some of these vessels uh, in, along the Great Passes. Strangely, they found two fossilized bottles, and one was a bottle of soda, which they had taken in at Gaul, a pointed amphora type of bottom which you can sink into the sand bath on a ship and the next bottle is a bottle of whiskey, both fossilized together. The medieval route between the West and South East Asia, circumventing the southernmost landmass of Asia, namely Sri Lanka, you can see they tried this later because these were, this passage was shallow. This was shallow and it was the reason for the Dutch to even design the flat bottom boat, which we call the Paru. But the, and the Paru was so large and Professor Venihitana who is here will tell you that they can really carry a lot of weight and I will show you where they carried 14 elephants, 14 elephants in a paddle boat and across this passageway, across this passageway because the elephant auctions were in the north in Jaffa. 